morning. Welcome to First Presbyterian Church of Metuchen. For all of you joining us here in the sanctuary, and a warm welcome to all of you joining us this morning via live stream. We are very glad you're here. I have just a few announcements before we begin worship this morning. Our Kirken of the Tartan service is a week away next Sunday. We will gather at 9.15 a.m. at the corner of Laureldale and Woodbridge Avenue. So please give yourselves some time to park and head out to our start point. Uh, it should be a wonderful Sunday celebrating our heritage. If you are joining us on the Egypt trip in February, please stay today for a meeting after worship. Grab a coffee, head to the chapel. There will be, uh, for those of you who are live streaming, there is going to be a Zoom option that should have been emailed earlier. The annual Hunger Walkathon is coming up November 6th at 2 p.m. It starts and ends at the Centenary Methodist Church here in Metuchen, um, supporting MICA, the Metuchen Edison Area Interfaith Council's effort to raise funds um, so that together we can help those in need. Pledge forms are available in the church narthex and the church office. Please check the Sunday paper, the last few pages of your worship bulletin for all upcoming events um, and things going on. Today, our coffee hour is in room 109, just through the hallway here, so please stay. I hope you join us for fellowship and refreshments. With that, let us prepare our hearts and spirits and rise for our call to worship. searched me and know me. You know when I sit down and when I rise up. You discern my thoughts from far away. You search out my path and my laying down and are acquainted with all my ways. Even before a word is on my tongue, O Lord, you know it completely. You hem me in, behind and before, and lay your hand upon me. Ascended to heaven, you are there. If I make my bed in Sheol, you are there. If I take the wings of the morning and settle at the farthest limits of the sea, even there your hand shall lead me, and your right hand shall hold me fast.
let us enter into our time of confession and adoration with a spirit of penance as we say together, God of mercy, search our heart, reveal to us our own heart, for so often we are afraid to imagine the goodness of life, the splendor of the morning, the glory of rising above the fray. We keep our heads down, we keep moving, we keep hoping to just get by. May your Holy Spirit conjure our hearts unto hope and lift us from breadcrumbs. Challenge us to cry out for what is good. Amen. Accept the gift of Jesus Christ that through his death and resurrection we receive never-ending grace and we are all forgiven. Rejoice in this gift this morning. Good morning. My name is Gary Ostermuller. I am an elder and chairman of the Stewardship Committee. Now before you nod off or the home viewers go for another cup of coffee, let me assure you that I'm not only, only here to share our need for money, I do have to bring that up, that's my job, but there are other points to consider. Our theme this year for Stewardship is where are all, we are all pieces of God's plan where do you fit in to our church? The First Presbyterian Church of Metuchen is a healthy and vibrant house of worship and a major pillar of this community. This was shared very loudly in social media by the leaders of Temple Emmanuel and others when we loaned them our sanctuary for their recent High Holy Days. We have a baptism this morning. Nothing better than welcoming another child into our church. And through the leadership of Pastor Gary, the very dedicated staff, the session, deacons, and all of the many volunteers, we have endured the pandemic while maintaining a constant level of membership. I know it doesn't feel like it when we look at the sanctuary on a Sunday morning, but there are a lot of members and non-members tuning in from home and continuing their support. When we think of donations to, or income to the church, we often think only of the offering plate. Actually, the members of this church have pledged consistently for the past several years during the pandemic. Thank you. The areas of income that took a hit were things like cash donations at the offering plate, commuter parking fees, and building usage. If you're not meeting or socializing in person, you're not paying for those. CNS not being in session had a significant impact. Overall, we took a big hit to our income, but we needed to keep going forward. Our staff was going above and beyond the call of duty, figuring out how to hold worship in a parking lot, exploring and purchasing technology for live streaming, walking the sanctuary with tape measures so that we could maintain social distance and get as many people in as possible. Seeking ways not to only continue the food pantry, but to increase the volume of food distribution as the need continued to rise. Our response to food insecurity has led us to receive a considerable donations from the community at large, both financial and from food, and to receive a large grant from Middlesex County to expand the food pantry. This is one way that our perseverance to move forward will be rewarded in the future. Does all this have a cost? Of course. But the church leadership felt it was more important to invest in our church and its programs 
than to take a fiscally conservative approach and fall behind the needs of our members and the community. Prior generations created an investment endowment fund for our preservation and emergencies. I would say that the last couple of years constituted an emergency. And my dry hands aren't working too good here. There we go. A piece of good news. Through the foresight of the Finance Committee, we received two uh, payroll Protection Program, or PPP, grants from the federal government, which it made up for most of our losses. That was only for 2020 and 2021. In 2022, Finance and the INE Committee agreed to fund the shortfall from our fund. This is not sustainable, as we are withdrawing at a greater percentage than planned, but it is important that we continue to build our programs for the health of our church. We are fortunate and blessed to have these abundant resources, resources that were entrusted to us by previous generations so we will have a vibrant church to pass on to the generations of the future. You will be receiving a letter and a pledge card next week. Please make your pledge and return the card to the office. We need your financial support. We need each of you to be a puzzle piece that will fit into the picture of our church. Thank you. Good morning. On behalf of the session of the First Presbyterian Church of Metuchen, I present for baptism Michaela Savannah Keating. Okay, meanwhile, back at the ranch, well, so I'm going to ask you a series of questions as your parents, and I'm going to ask you a question as your sponsors. So our tradition in baptizing a child is that we're recognizing that God has chosen to love Michaela before Michaela knows him, <laughs> and, and that really is... is she knows that she's loved, but she may not understand it out loud. Mm -hmm. So when I ask you to reaffirm your baptism, I want you to remember that too. That, that God, before you knew it, God chose to love you just like her. <clears throat> so, do you trust in your Savior, Jesus Christ? I do. Do you renounce sin and evil in the world? I do. Will you be a thoughtful disciple of Jesus and follow in his ways so Michaela understands what it means to be good? Okay. <clears throat> As the sponsors, will you help Michaela see what it means to be a good human being, that she would love God with all her heart and her neighbor as herself? Would, will you do that? I thought so. <laughs> all right. Now, the water. Please pray with me. Oh, nope, Jim, you're up. <laughs> A question for the congregation. Do you, as members of the Church of Jesus Christ, promise to guide and nurture this child by word and deed, with love and prayer, encouraging her to know and follow Christ and be a faithful member of this church? Do you? 
Please pray with me. Almighty and gracious God, we pray that this water would be for Michaela, a moment where in her heart she can sense the presence of your Holy Spirit and know that she is your beloved. Amen. Okay. Okay, okay, choir can't see you. <laughs> okay, okay, all right. Michaela Savannah, I baptize you in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen. <laughs> that was a solidarity cry. Congratulations. Well, I'd like to invite all children to come forward and join Hannah and myself this morning. <laughs> Good morning. Find a seat, find a seat. Hello. <laughs> we can do some on the ground too. Yeah. Any extra seat? Mm -hmm. We can do some on the ground. Yeah, come join us. And good morning to all the children on live stream as well. Hope you scoot a little closer. <laughs> so what do you think about my hat? You do not like it. No. <laughs> Why? Not a good color on me. Okay, I can take that. <laughs> what about me? Yeah, what do you think? Do you like it? I'm a donkey? Okay, yeah, I was wondering if I was maybe a donkey or a bunny. I was thinking Baby Yoda. Maybe. Or Baby Yoda. That's great. Yeah, the gray mm -hmm. baby Yoda. All right. Yeah, it's a little hat, it's a little costume. Anyone else have some costumes at home? Maybe you're gonna wear them sometime this week. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Any, what's your favorite costume that you've ever worn? Panda. Panda. Panda, that's a good one. Anyone else have a favorite costume that they like to wear? It doesn't have to be for Halloween. Sometimes we dress up other times too. Mm -hmm. Hannah, do you have one? Oh, well, I have a treat because uh, I have a picture of when I was in fourth grade. Uh, my sister dressed up as a skeleton, and I dressed up as Frankenstein. <laughs> uh, yes, so you can see this. My mom used to throw us Halloween parties. Yes? I'm going to make a big Halloween party. Oh, my gosh, that is so fun. <laughs> um, so my mom used to throw us these Halloween parties and all of our classes were invited and yeah it was super fun. So um, does or is anyone going to be a superhero for Halloween? Or oh yeah you are? <gasps> That's fun. What superhero? Black, Black Panther. Panther. Oh, I'm excited for the new Black Panther movie to come out. <laughs> um, so when we dress up like a character for Halloween or maybe just when we're feeling sad or down, you know, we're sort of pretending to be like them. And, you know, when we take the costume off, we're back to being ourselves, right? You know? But, and maybe uh, it's even helpful sometimes to dress up because when we dress up, um, we can feel extra strong, 
like how a superhero feels strong. Um, and that might help us feel strong too. Yeah, and it's also good to know that whatever we dress up as and however that makes us feel good sometimes, like if we're feeling sad or we want to pretend like we're someone else, whenever we take it off, we go back to ourselves. And being ourselves is just as good as any character that we dress up as. And the best feeling is being loved for who you are. No matter how we dress up, we can always trust that God sees us as we are and loves us as we are. Just remember the baptism we just saw for Michaela and how Reverend Gary said, before we knew it, God chose us and God loved us. So whether we're wearing a costume or not, and however makes, that makes us feel, we can always trust and remember that. Will you pray with me? Dear God, thank you for all of our friends who gathered here with us to, this morning. Thank you for loving us and making us strong, whether or not we're wearing a costume. Um, we thank you for times of fun and play, and we pray that as we wear these things throughout this week or any other time, we remember our heart and ourselves and that you love us always. We pray for all your children this morning. Amen. 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 Our first scripture reading comes from Zechariah, chapter 1, verses 7 to 12. On the 24th day of the 11th month, the month of Shabbat, in the second year of Darius, the word of the Lord came to the prophet Zechariah, son of Berechiah, son of Iddo. And Zechariah said, In the night I saw a man riding on a red horse. He was standing among the myrtle trees in the glen and behind him were red sorrel and white horses. Then I said, what are these, my Lord? The angel who talked with me said to me, I will show you what they are. So the man who was standing among the myrtle trees answered, these are those whom the Lord has sent to patrol the earth. Then they spoke to the angel of the Lord who was standing among the myrtle trees. We have patrolled the earth and lo, the whole earth remains at peace. Then the angel of the Lord said, O Lord of hosts, how long will you withhold mercy from Jerusalem and the cities of Judah, with which you have been angry these 70 years? This is the word of the Lord.
Well, that was lovely. Our second lesson is taken from the Gospel of Matthew. Please listen for the word put forth in Scripture. As Jesus and his disciples were leaving Jericho, a large crowd followed him. There were two blind men sitting by the roadside. When they heard that Jesus was passing by, they shouted, Lord, have mercy on us, son of David. The crowd sternly ordered them to be quiet. But they shouted even more loudly, have mercy on us, Lord, son of David. Jesus stood still and called them, saying, what do you want me to do for you? They said to him, Lord, let our eyes be opened. Moved with compassion, Jesus touched their eyes. Immediately, they regained their sight and followed him. This is the word of the Lord. Please pray with me. Give us eyes to see and ears to hear. Help us to see what we cannot see and to hear what has yet to reach our heart. We pray this in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Irene Levesque was a slip of a woman who was a ball of energy. In her 70s, you could spot Irene around town maintaining one of the many whiskey barrel planters she created, making Patascala look like a quaint, all-American place to live. The front of Irene's house was always decorated for the season. Her red and white geraniums were of legendary status, and her yard was manicured. She did all of this. What really inspired people about Irene was not just her energy, but how she lived. She lived quietly, and she kept going despite her losses. Irene lost her beloved husband, Jack, to a light plane crash a few years before I met her. And she herself was a cancer survivor more than once. Irene was courageous. I can remember her sitting in her living room, which, which mirrored her lawn and porch. Both, both were immaculate and both decorated perfectly. The woman had taste and style. She wore a silk scarf to cover her once again bald head. She showed me to make me laugh. The cancer had returned. Irene assured me she was going to make it. Life was hard sometimes, but you don't give up. You, you keep going. She said, things just take a little longer for me right now. She was embarrassed that the chemotherapy didn't allow her to work at breakneck speed or work as long a day as she would like. But she'd get it done, she said. I was there to check on Irene. And I was also there how we could help her help others. One of the many jobs Irene did for others, did without return or pay, one of her jobs was to decorate the sanctuary for weddings. I will never forget the first time I, I walked into her transformative work. What was once a Spartan, sturdy house of worship was now a delicate garden, enchanted. A space where a bride's dress would not seem out of place. But this took hours without the drag of chemotherapy. And people were concerned that Irene would not ask for help or be realistic 
about how much pain she was in. So they sent me in. The ladies are worried, I said. They love you, but they are worried that you will have no ability to stop. Irene valued the, the frankness and the care. And she said, I'm just going to do it over the course of a week. I'll just do it as much as I can each day. I won't push it. This was not what I was hoping for, but at least I had something to report. And the report was true. When the next wedding came, Irene started on Sunday and came in each day for a few hours until the sanctuary was complete on Friday. What would have taken her a good day was achieved by coming every day. Friday afternoon, I stood with Irene as we looked over the transformed sanctuary. It took enormous energy, but it also gave it. I could see the power she felt from her work. Everything was set for the wedding tomorrow. Someone's big day was going to be beautiful. But there was a problem. No one told the sexton. She thought the wedding rehearsal was the wedding because the decorations were complete and the people came and left. When I arrived early Saturday morning, I found the entire sanctuary stripped bare. Late that night, all the decorations came down and were now gathered in the trash bag. Calls were made. Tears flowed. The sexton was beside herself and Irene cried with her, comforting her, telling her, how could you know? With hours to go, Friends came with irons and ironing boards. Spouses were brought in tow, and soon the crumpled ribbons were pressed. The delicate ivy was restored. The runner back in place, and all was set just as the florist arrived. No one would ever know. It was lost. And then it was restored. I can remember early on, maybe just a few months, coming to Pataskala, just out of seminary, I can remember coming home for lunch one day and turning to Kathy and saying, I'm really shocked. Living people are interesting. Kathy nodded and concurred and allowed me my epiphany. You see, up to that point in my young life, I'd only dealt with dead people, at least in terms of fascination. I earned a degree in history and quickly added two more where I spent all my time in the 16th century. It had just never occurred to me that people who are alive could be just as fascinating as people who died long ago. Who would have thought, I said. Irene was one of those people. She fascinated me. What sticks with me most is that her combination of humility and courage. Often people are one or the other. You know, the, the meek support, the brave lead. It's an oversimplification, but it does scan. Yet here was a person for whom grief should be engulfing her. Here was a woman who should be raising her fist at God or struggling with bitterness. And yet, she
she was quietly, humbly, holding on to joy, creating beauty, laughing about her jaunty scarf. There were so many life lessons I was given in Pataskala, so many gifts given to a young pastor shaping my character. Yet Irene is someone who not only shaped me, but she also lives in me. My times with her made an indelible mark. And the impression is this. Be bold, humble, and courageous. Be sure to hold on to bold. Be meek so your courage is not arrogance. And be brave so your humility doesn't make you timid. Our reading today from the Gospel of Matthew is the end of a long lesson in humility. Up to this point, Jesus roamed and was free, and, and as he roamed, he taught and lived compassion, with, all with a simple message. Humility is how you find the kingdom of God. But all of that is about to change our reading is the last moment Jesus is free. From this moment forward, Jesus enters the last week of his life. The, in Jerusalem, he loses his freedom. Matthew, Mark, and Luke all record this final healing of blindness in Jericho. The healing is to say, Jesus' ministry finds a fitting end with one last moment of compassion. Again, this is the theme, the thread that runs throughout the life of Jesus. He had compassion. He stopped for the broken. It's hard to see this, but a key to our story is to imagine how the, the enthusiasm of heading to Jerusalem and caught up in the crowd, and they're going to take the city they're heading out. Then Jesus stops. And he says to two blind, blind men, what do you need? He was still free to come and go, start and stop, to give mercy. This is the long narrative of the gospel. Compassion leads us to sacrifice, to put others first, to be last. In compassion, we, we learn to put down vengeance and anger and fear. This compassion creates in us the ability to walk humbly. It's fitting for Jesus to stop and have compassion just as he always did. This long story of mercy is the common account of Matthew, Mark, and Luke. True, they each have their own version of a shared story, but their, but their common account of mercy corroborates one another. They're the same. And for this reason, when they veer off, when Luke describes Samaria or Mark makes everything immediate, when there are differences in their accounts, we need to stop and be curious. Our reading today is a common story of Matthew, Mark, and Luke, yet each of them tells it differently. They all record this as happening in Jericho, but Mark and Luke have one person who is healed, blind Bartimaeus. Matthew, if you remember from the reading, has two blind men. For Matthew and Mark, th this is the last moment before Jerusalem. The crowd is heading out. It comes to a stop. Luke describes this healing as something that happened just before they got to Jericho, on the outskirts of the town. So not so much a final moment, but 
one of the final moments. The difference of the second blind man is most intriguing. Did Matthew get the story wrong? Did he have a different tradition? Before or after Jericho is interesting, but a second blind person changes the story. Some suggest this is Matthew's signature. Each of the Gospels have moments where scholars believe the evangelists sign their work. Matthew could be inserting himself here, saying, I'm Matthew. I'm like a blind person who can now see. I like that. Yet what I believe, why Matthew inserts the second blind person, is to announce the next theme, the next lesson of the gospel, the second restoration of sight. In the life of Jesus, in his ministry, we learn humility. We saw what it means to live in meekness, trust, compassion. Our sight, as it were, was restored. The first blind person. The second blind person is the next lesson. From this point forward, from Jericho onward, we're now in...